thank you all very much for taking the time out of your very busy schedules to come and hear from the DOE on stony coral tissue loss disease. Um, I'm going to be very short. I just wanted to say welcome on behalf of the DOE. I'm the director, uh, Gina Ebanks Petrie. We have a team here this morning who have been working on this disease as it has emerged uh, in Cayman uh, since about June of this year. Stony coral tissue loss disease has been around. It's been in Florida reefs since about 2014. And throughout that time, and specifically around 2017, we've seen it really take hold in other Caribbean countries. Um, our, team, the, our purpose this morning really is to present to you on what we know so far about this novel disease. Uh, and to help do that this morning, uh, Dr. Croy McCoy is going to come up shortly after I've finished, and he will basically take you through an overview and summary of what we know about stony coral tissue loss disease. And then we're going to have Tammy Warrender, who is a scientist working with the DOE at the moment on this disease, specifically coordinating our efforts. She's going to describe what we've done so far, what our findings are, and how potentially you can help us. And then Croy will come back and talk a little bit more about some of the logistics around uh, what we need help from you with. Uh, and then we want to open the floor up and give you lots of time to ask us questions and provide your input and suggestions to us. So without taking any longer, um, thanks again for your time. And I'm going to call on Dr. Croy to uh, come up and do his presentation. Before I move on, I just want to acknowledge the presence of uh, Ms. Andrea Bodden in the room. She's here on behalf of the minister and chief officer who have uh, other commitments this morning. So thanks, Andrea. Take good notes and go back and tell them about the discussion. Thanks very much. Hi. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Um, and welcome everyone. As my director mentioned, stony coral tissue loss disease first emerged in September 2014 and out of the Port of Miami in Florida. It went largely left unchecked due to the dredging within the vicinity of the port. So there was sort of multiple failures, not only from scientists, but also um, resource managers, policymakers, and others that were responsible for the health of coral reefs there. It has since spread throughout the whole Florida reef tract with detrimental or lethal consequences and also to Caribbean countries more than 10 and more so Grand Cayman in June 2020. Due to its high prevalence and mortality rates within sites or the geographic area, Stony coral tissue loss is either proven to be the most virulent of all coral diseases known to date. Typical disease outbreaks only affect a few species. A few of us can relate back to the acropores, the uh, Elkhorn and Stagorn coral in the 80s that uh, white pox disease pretty much wiped out. However, stony coral tissue loss disease impacts more than 20 species at any given time. This results in about 60 to 100% mortality rate. And that all depends on the species, the size of the colonies. Death of the colony usually happens within weeks to a few months. The difference or it's very unusual for any coral disease to be um, not limited with seasonal perturbations or like most coral diseases will flare up in the summertime when the water temperatures reach the, the highest thermal stress. With uh, stony coral, there seems to be no fluctuation with it and just barrels on through. Some of the research conducted suggests that bleaching does retard a bit, but that's two things operating on the same animal at the same time. Also, um, the transmission modes that we know of is 
through direct contact and also through um, travel by the prevailing currents and stuff. However, there's also uh, appearances of this disease in isolated islands and stuff that suggest that there's other modes of transmission, one of those being the, uh, the ballast water of ships. And that sort of correlates from country to country and port to port in some places where it appears first. There's so little known about this disease, the fact, and you gotta realize the fact that uh, um, correlation doesn't necessarily transfer to um, causation. So the jury's still out with that. You can just correlate things at the moment as to outbreaks and stuff. The treatment options that they've been using in some countries uh, have been antibiotic treatment, chlorinated epoxy, trench in and fill in with uh, epoxy to try to stop the progression. Probiotics is one of the new ones. And a few other novel mitigating factors that we are trying here, and we're probably one of the first countries to use some of these methods. And I'll let uh, Tammy Warren to talk to you all more about that, what our efforts and what we're doing. However, the most promising of all the therapeutics so far has been the antibiotic treatment and the uh, probiotic. In order to, to, for us to all tackle this regionally, uh, we need to get a complete understanding, not only of the disease, but also the transmission modes. All of this work is essential. Cayman is in a very unique position in the fact that we caught it early and we got on it right away. And also the fact that we still have healthy reefs that we can try to understand this disease and what just say the um, bacteria, bacterial community, the microbiome or the micro, microbiology of the animal, of the healthy ones versus the unhealthy ones and try to find what, what pathogen is causing that. That would not only help us, but would also help the region as we all fight this disease. Uh, that being said, you know, we have partnered with um, multiple institutions and experts to conduct uh, virology, histology, pathology, and microbiomics studies in an effort to identify the causative agent or agents of this disease. If this work is successful, uh, we can further develop some therapeutic treatments and possibly develop a toolkit for neighboring countries in the region to fight this disease. Lastly, knowing what we know about the disease so far and the disastrous consequences of reef managers not intervening and mitigating against this disease outbreak in not only in Florida, but in the US Virgin Islands also and other countries it would be an injustice to the coral reefs of the Cayman Islands if we did not intervene. So intervening is not an, a management option for us. The costs and sacrifices that we will ask over the next few months will be minuscule when compared to the potential financial losses that we all will are associated with the collapse of our coral reef ecosystem is currently the, the rate it moves at parallels other countries, which is about 1.2 to 1.5 miles per month. The loss of tourism ac activities, and as an example, the loss of tourism activities and the recreational fishery that we all hold dear to our hearts here, costs could run potential into the millions for the country. That being said, as we move on with the presentation that Mrs. Warner will do next, so we ask compliance and cooperation and help as we confront this disease going forward. Thank you, Mrs. Warner. Hi, everyone. 
thank you everybody for taking your time to come here today on this very important matter that we're trying to discuss with you all. Um, hopefully this presentation works on Zoom. Maybe someone can give me a signal if it does not. <laughs> like for now, for instance. So stony coral tissue loss disease was first found on the north of Grand Cayman in June 2020. It was first reported by Tom Burns from Cayman Marine Lab um, and the Department of Environment went out straight away to monitor um, the site and whether it was the disease or not. And it was very clear straight away that it was infecting multiple species of coral and that it was the same disease as being experienced in other areas of the Caribbean and in Florida. The appearance of this disease um, is similar to other types of diseases in the way that it's rapidly losing tissue, but it happens a lot faster than other diseases do. So it appears on a coral structure as focal or multifocal lesions, which just means that it appears in one part of the coral or it can appear in multiple areas of the coral. And um, the progression can be up to four centimeters today. So, so like it's been said already, it is a lot faster than other diseases in the region. These photos are taken on the north of Grand Cayman. And um, as we've said before, it affects 20 plus species of coral and some are endangered and most of them are very important for the reef structure um, around the Cayman Islands. And um, particularly our big brain corals and our Montastria cavernosas, the big starlet corals. Um, the way that this disease moves is very different in comparison to other coral diseases as well. It seems to infect certain species first before it infects others. So on this slide, we have um, the smooth flower, flower coral on the top left. Um, that is one of the highly susceptible species, as well as meandrina, meandritis, and maize coral in the bottom middle. They seem to get, um, uh, and Dicosenia stokesii on the top right. Those three are the most susceptible species of coral. So they seem to show infections before our other species like brain corals and starlet corals or, or other corals. These are some other species, Sedastria sideria is our massive starlet coral. It is the one coral that seems to show slightly different signs. Um, as some of you may know, on when these corals bleach, they fluoresce like often different colors. They fluoresce purples or pinks or blues. Um, so they seem to fluoresce quite strongly and then have these dots of darker fluorescence that slowly turn into a white patch like what you see on other species. These are results from in Florida where um, a study was done. It was actually the first study that documented um, this disease outside of the Port of Miami by Bill Pratt. He um, established the mortality rates, which show about 60 to 100% on the different coral species, which is very alarming. So out of all of the tagged corals that they tagged during their study um, on the different species, some died, all of them died, 100% mortality, and some was 60% mortality. So it varies with different species. Pillar corals are also a highly susceptible species and they're also a very rare and, in, and endangered coral um, in the Caribbean. Uh, this is actually taken outside Rum Point Channel. So this is the first colony that we've lost to stony coral tissue loss disease. And just to show the rapidness of the progression, these photos were taken a week apart. So it can be quite hard to see um, the darker Darker brown areas are the live corals, and you can see the you can see the tentacles, um, in these photographs, and um, where the other areas is where the algae is starting to colonize. So if you look closely at the images, you can see how much the disease has progressed over just one week. Um, there is some um, good news that it doesn't infect all species. Um, we are seeing 
some death of the species on our diseased area. So we haven't taken them out of the game completely. Um, but from other areas, we believe that these species on the slide here, the Paraiti species and the Acropora branch and coral species seem to be more resilient to this disease than other species. Um, like Dr. Croy said, researchers have been unable to determine the cause and the, mo the method of transmission for this disease, but its evidence suggests that it's a bacterial pathogen that is transmitted by touch and in the water column. Um, the reason that they feel that it's a bacteria is because they've had some success in different regions with antibiotic treatments. Um, and they know that if two corals are touching each other, it could jump from one coral to the next. And they know that um, like if you put two corals in a tank and one's diseased and one is healthy, the other coral will get infected because it's in the same tank as another one. So we believe that it is transferring by the currents in that way as well. So this is just some visual, and I'm not about to do a coral lesson in any way, but we, it is sometimes hard to differentiate between other diseases. And in particular, at this time of year, we have coral bleaching. So black band disease is one of the main diseases that we also see on our reefs. It's seasonal normally. We normally see a lot more black band disease in the summer, but you can get it all year round. Um, it has a very distinctive black band, which, uh, we don't always see on stony coral tissue loss disease. Uh, when, we, when we're on the disease site, there's often more diseases in amongst stony coral tissue loss disease, which makes it exciting and fun to try and identify things. Um, but white plague disease on the right-hand side there, that is um, probably one of the most difficult to differentiate between because it's also a white sort of barrier line that's moving along the coral. But normally white plague disease comes from a single source, whereas um, stony coral tissue loss disease often comes from multiple areas on the same coral. Um, and it's often a lot slower as well in its progression. Uh, coral bleaching, the main difference is when a coral bleaches, its tissue is still on the coral. So if you look close enough, you should, you should see like a translucent slime and often see the tentacles um, if you have a look um, at this slide, it's quite hard to see, but maybe we can go back and people can zoom in a little bit more and you could actually still see the tentacles and it's bleached. And that means that it does, it can recover. Um, if the water temperatures don't stay too hot for too long, corals can respond and become, and respond and get their uh, algaes back uh, from the water column and not die from coral bleaching. Whereas disease, which this is a picture of stony coral tissue loss disease on a Montastria cavernosa colony, and it's a good uh, visual ID for looking at the difference between bleaching and disease because you can clearly see at the bottom the older death, which is colonized by a thicker layer of macroalgae. And um, the area on the top is more recent death, which is slowly being covered by like turf algae. So it looks almost fuzzy and dull. Whereas the, the new death, which is right next to the, the living tissue arrow there, it's bright white. So it's recently dead and you can see the skeleton and it doesn't have any tissue on it because the living tissue is actually that little brown part right in the middle of the colony. And that's, the last part of the tissue that will be lost from the coral. Um, and it does sometimes fall off in a way where you could actually see the tissue sloughing off is the word they use for it. It just slowly drifts off into the water column. So, and then contributes to the spread more. So some pros, some positives. We believe that we've caught it reasonably early. In June, we responded very effectively and efficiently to the disease. Um, and yeah, very happy with the way that our response is going. Uh, we have a response team at the Department of Environment um, and the Cayman Islands have less anthropogenic factors. So less run runoff from agriculture, uh, less nutrification and things like that. Um, some corals may show resistance um, The this, the results that I showed you from the study from Florida, that's what happened in Florida. Florida has a lot less corals than we do 
and it doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to be exactly what happens in, in Cayman. Um, some negatives is the fact that we have more species and we have more corals and all the corals are closer together so that can actually mean that the disease spread is quicker because it can jump from coral to coral faster and higher virul virulence. Um, the rapid spread is obviously one of the most imposing factors that we're trying to deal with here at the Department of Environment. Um, it's very fast in comparison to any other coral and it, isn't, um, it, it doesn't slow down with seasons, like cooler water temperatures don't affect it. Um, and we don't have a cure. We don't know the pathogen, so we don't have a cure yet. Um, like Dr. Croy mentioned, there is some different treatments that are coming out from uh, international scientists and we are planning to use them accordingly as well with the ones that we're using just now. And we, we have linked this disease to COVID just in a way that helps everyone understand like what we're dealing with under the water. Um, and it's difficult because unlike closing the borders and not letting the infected individuals into Cayman, we can't prevent the spread in the water currents. It's, we can't put up like a, a blockage to stop the currents from flowing from one place to another. So it's, it's very tricky. So our response is we are monitoring the spread of the disease. Uh, we're removing diseased corals. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll expand a little bit on our monitoring. We've, we've, at the beginning, we we searched the islands. We went, we we set up teams in Little Cayman and Cayman Brac to do um, tow surveys around the islands to see if they could see any sco uh, stony coral tissue loss disease from the surface. We have been finding it predominantly on our shallow reefs so far. So they have been effectively trawling around the islands looking for this disease and we've had no reports so far in the sister islands. And um, we have been doing the same thing on Grand Cayman, towing away from the diseased area to see the extent so we can find out that perimeter um, from where it's moved to. And that's how we know that it's traveling a mile a month. Um, so after we we establish the area that has been spreading to in Grand Cayman and establish that it seems to be localized to the North Reefs. Um, we then started intervening and in using specific treatments to deal with this disease. Uh, one example of our um, response strategy is removing diseased corals. Um, it's something that's quite difficult for us to do, but we believe that intervening is the best course. Well, it's better to intervene than to not do anything. We have a wealth of information from other countries that haven't had the opportunity that we've had to respond quickly to this disease. Um, so because we've had time on our side so far, removing corals and having these treatments in place has been a great privilege to us. Um, so removing the colonies, sort of going from the perimeter of the disease and working backwards towards the epicenter at Penny's Arch. And um, we are creating a fire break, similar to like you would clear vegetation around a bushfire. We are removing highly susceptible species from a large area to the west of the coral disease outbreak. And this is in the hope to slow down and possibly stop we're we're hoping for the best and um, and but we believe that by removing the highly infected individuals it might mean that we put those little fires out and it doesn't spread to the rest of the colonies within that area uh, the novel in situ treatments we're using we are still considering using antibiotics it's it's one of those things that's hard. It's, it's been used in other countries as a last um, effort like to use antibiotic treatments. And um, we'd like to minimize the use of them if we do decide to go forward with using that treatment. But there's other treatments that we're 
hoping will become available soon. We just received news that a probiotic treatment um, has been successful in Florida. So just like you would take um, a healthy probiotic into your gut to stimulate your positive bacteria that help fight infections, they have taken corals that have shown um, resilience to this disease um, on Florida reefs and they've cultured healthy bacteria that they can put on a coral colony that's diseased and stop the disease. So it's very exciting research and it's you can add that into the environment and it's already there, whereas and adding in antibiotics and things is it's different adding a chemical into the, the reef system than it is adding um, components that are already there. We are sampling for histology and pathology and virology. Uh, we think it's bacteria because it has had some success with antibiotic treatments, but there is, um, there is a thought going around a hypothesis that it might also be a virus and bacteria working together. So we're taking samples of our colonies and sending them overseas to experts um, who are capable of looking at the microbial communities on the corals and that can try and detect this virus again for trying to find a cure for the disease. And dive site closures in the diseased area is something that we would like to talk to you about today. We are doing um, this multi-pronged approach um, and we're just trying to like alleviate all um, um, areas where we might be spreading the disease. So any possible mechanism of transmission we're trying to stop so that it does not progress past where it is today. So this is a map of the, of the area that we've been surveying and um, where the disease is just now, which you have a picture of in front of you as well. Uh, the disease epicenter at Penny's Arch, you can see with that first arrow on the right, we, we were working predominantly in this area and then we redid some of our, our tow efforts, taking people behind the boat and monitoring from above to look at the coral. Um, and we found another area outside of the main channel that looked like it had been there for a, a lot longer than we had known about. So we, we think that that might possibly be a new outbreak in that region and it's also progressing west. And we think that because the area immediately to the east uh, doesn't have disease. There isn't that much coral there because with it being the area just outside the channel, there's high water flow and more nutrients in other areas of our reef. So the coral cover there is not high. Um, but as a theory, the, the corals that are infected there are the corals that we would normally expect to be infected much later, like your big brain corals and your and bolder star corals. Um, so it is possible that there's a new outbreak that started there like a month or two ago and is also moving to the west coast. Uh, our fire break is approximately three or four miles um, away from the west coast. So that's what we're dealing with. Um, we know that the disease is four miles away from the west coast of Grand Cayman and um, it's moving at a mile and a half a month or a mile a month. So the possible factors causing this rapid spread are the prevailing westernly currents that they also go east as well, but they're predominantly western. And um, that is clear as day that fish and other invertebrates are feeding on this um, disease, opportunistically feeding on the disease um, and possibly transferring the disease from coral to coral. Direct cor uh, contact, a lot of the corals are based right next to each other, so um, it could jump that way. And then the fourth um, option or is the possible transfer of the disease by humans. Um, and that is by touching the reef and having it on your gear and then going to another reef that does not have the disease. Um, so transferring the disease between um, help, uh, infected dive sites to uninfected dive sites. So one of the protocols that we want to put in place today um, 
outside of dive closures, uh, which Dr. Croy will talk about soon, um, is disinfecting dive gear. Uh, every time that the Department of Environment goes out to the sites on the north, we come back and we disinfect our gear. Um, one of the handouts that we've given to you today, um, I'll have to remember to send those on Zoom, the handouts that we gave out today, as well as the presentation. Um, we, we have been using the ammonium-based disinfectant to clean our gear, um, whereas chlorine or bleach is another option. Um, it, they know that just washing your gear in normal fresh water is not enough to get rid of vi virus or bacterial compounds. So we have to use some form to sterilize our equipment after diving on the north coast um, in the hope to not transfer the disease. Um, it is known that the pathogens on the dive gear can survive for extended periods of time. Um, so it's even a theory that um, if you go traveling and you still have some of the, vi the virus or bacteria in your BCD, it can, and it's still a little bit wet in there, it could still, you can bring it overseas as another way that it can move around and how it might have got to Cayman in the first place. We're not sure about that. Um, so yeah, we recommend that to use um, the ammonium-based disinfectants or bleach on your dive gear. And for more sensitive equipments like regulators or computers or cameras, you can use a antibacterial soap or um, isopropyl alcoholic wipe to disinfect your sensitive equipment. So um, this is what we've been using. It's um, called Virobac, and that's just the price. We got it from Roper's Enterprises, so it's just an option for people that want to use um, ammonium-based disinfectant. The main, the main thing about ammonium disinfectant is it's not environmentally friendly. So we use it because we have a proper means to dispose of it. Um, for people that um, are taking, taking this out on their boat, so we, we're actually asking people to um, wash their gear at the end of the day. And then if they want to do um, more than one dive on the North Coast, it would be good to wash gear in between dives as well. So if you were to take a tub to wash <laughs> to wash your gear with, um, it, we don't want it to leak into the environment. So chlorine or bleach, bleach would be a better option to use on board a vessel. We recommend to only use ammonium-based compounds if you have a means of disposing it back on land. Okay, so now we're going to talk about um, our dive sites and the area of disease that we are recommending to be closed um, to diving. I'm going to let Croy take over for this part. And he'll touch a little bit more on the disinfectant as well. As uh, Tammy uh, mentioned about trying to put a standardized protocol in place for disinfecting gear, the ammonia-based ones are probably the most effective, but it has to be handled with care with uh, the disposal of it. So if that particular type of solution is used, or chemical, um, the mixture would be dunking your gear, but the, the, the bath that you put it in would have to be disposed of on land to a filtration system that it doesn't get back it directly into the environment. It can't be sent down drains or boat bilges or anything of the sort. So that, that's a little bit more cumbersome to work with, but it's more effective in the sense of taking care of pathogens. And as she mentioned about the, um, the other alternative of chlorine base, such as bleach, that is less lethal to the environment, but also effective. And that's something that we need to discuss today and come to some agreement that we can 
move forward with standard procedures and how we disinfect our gear if boats do dive to north. We are proposing to um, close off the area to in water activities between Bears Paw, as you can see to the west there, and Delilah's Delight to the east, just east of, if you all know, Bows and Bluff here, Cayman Kai area. And the reason or justification for that is the sheer fact that that is the whole disease reef track. So we are trying to limit any activity in there to potentially further spread the disease around the island. And even we ourselves are working there, go through a, from the beginning, a standard protocol of totally disinfecting our gear whenever we, we are in that area. And we're also going to suggest that any dive on the north outside of the disease area that you can dive, that you do disinfect your gear, because what you don't, we don't want happening is we dive on the north and then we zip around to the west side, potentially taking the disease there. Because there's so little unknown about this and the sheer fact that it could possibly be within your BC or your wetsuit or anything, you just become a vector and amplify the problem we have and potentially as I said, spreading the disease further away. This also includes uh, the bilges on boats. Um, we strongly suggest that any boat that goes on the north for any period of time within that diseased area, they at least uh, bleach their, their bilges in an effort not to get some of the pathogens in there and then go around east south or west further spreading the disease. That being said, um, we really ask your cooperation and compliance as we put all of our efforts into trying to slow the disease. As Tammy mentioned earlier in the presentation, we have these uh, particular species that are like little fires that sort of go ahead of the whole disease front like embers and the whole forest fire comes from behind and just sort of engulfs the reefs which are the um, Dicocinia which is the elliptical star coral, the Meandrina, the uh, maize coral I think that is and the um, Emosophilia which is a uh, smooth flower coral. So as she explained with the fire break that we we're doing, what we did, we went ahead of the disease front there and worked backwards. We sort of taken these species out and we put them in a catchment area. Because one of the things that is strange about this disease also, it doesn't affect the inner reefs, like behind the back reef environment. So we have them in an area as such, so that when we do get a handle on this disease or it moves through or wherever we go with it, we can reattach those back on the reef. And the, the diseased ones are, um, has a death sentence pretty much anyways, because it's almost 100% mortality. We have, uh, we're putting those on land, sterilizing them, keeping the three-dimensional structures so that we can reattach those at a later date. Because, you know, literature shows that, you know, other planular larvae will seek out similar species or the same species, settle on and resheet. So there's, there's a lot in work what we're trying to do at the same time. The main objective right now that we're working on is trying to slow this disease towards the Seven Mile Beach area. That's the bread and butter of our whole dive industry in a nutshell in a lot of ways. So <coughs> we are putting all efforts we can into to that aspect of it. Then we'll work on the eastern front there. With that said, I'll leave it up to you all to ask questions, and we're here to answer them. Yes, sir? I'm Captain yeah, Bryce. I'm the guy that trained the stingers and so forth. So what I'm trying to say is that we've noticed more danger now with um, car damaging 
had a lot to do in 19, or before 1983. 1983, I had a riot around it and destroyed. Yeah, that was, that was in the, the okay. we call it Pancho, the, Elkhorn and Staghorn quarrels you're yeah, talking about? No, I mean, it, yeah, but they. The I lost it there. Okay, um, besides that, thinking of, of the area like we're looking at here, you can notice that that's in front of the channel. That area that the seepage of things that came from out of the country is growing it. So otherwise, the current goes out to the channel much more than what it would be. So that's the way you get that all the time. Every little time, every six hours, you have to change the pipe. So otherwise, that's going out. That is, uh, is damaging the car. I mean, and to get, um, I feel like, like a way that maybe that otherwise that you can help this current you don't have a restaurant current, especially when you get inside the region. Most most times, right? So I would figure that if they got to fighting it, I think if they would put some sort of a some drum or something made out of cement or anything, and put the liquid in it and then it gets seep out. Seep out, seep out. While nobody is not there doing it, it is still being done to the back door. So I would think that that would be a next little hand and help clear the, the, the problem. And long as I think if we could do it, this would be really good. If we could ever bring the sea urgent back. The sea urgence is the upkeep of the next car. But it's crawling over it all the time. Good red and bad red. Red and bad red comes and wash it off. And it goes in the water. So that is, that is what I would suggest. And, and in other words, uh, I think in regard to how I believe we really would need more than just the people going and putting the definite time on it besides having something set that is working all the time. In those areas that are with the channel is feeding the problem to the car. Yes, thank you for your suggestion on that. Um, however, in amongst all of these species as Mrs. Warner indicated there are some corals that are showing resistance and I would imagine treating as such would also kill those in the, the whole mix. And one thing we're trying to not do is those that do show resistance to this disease, we are, that's a plus for the reefs of the Caymans in the sense that we, they are they will be the ones that will be steadfast through this episode, just in case we we turn up in the end, though we're optimistic, not being able to halt or stop the disease or find proper therapeutic treatments that will help the disease corals. But thank you. It's, it's a good suggestion. Yes, sir. Did you say that you are not finding any instances of stone coral tissue loss disease on the inside of the barrier reef or the shallow deep areas? We haven't, and <coughs> all the literature suggests that it's not, and that is almost isolated in a sense that it's from the, like around the uh, seven, eight meter contour on out. Okay. So, not not saying that it will not reach there. Just at the moment, all the data well, suggests that it's too heavy. If it was fluffy and <laughs> you know, it floated in the surface, that may mean that it's holding closer to the reef structure itself. When a piece of flesh sloughs off, it it's not going to the surface. It's neutral or even slightly negative. 
point, that may be a big advantage. <laughs> um, it, we, we don't know really. It is so much unknown about it. It's a bit like COVID yeah. off the reef in a sense. You can uh, term it as that. But it may be that light penetration has some element of it because it's not as prevalent on the deeper sites. And <laughs> so it's mainly on the, the, uh, that shallow terrace reef track and, you know, with optimum conditions for it to flourish is in that area that we know so far about it, you know, like it causes some sort of um, breakdown in the, at a cellular level when the, between the, the cellular zooxanthellae and the host cells and stuff. But that's something, again, that we are working on in an effort to better understand it. If we can understand it, we can apply things to it. Is there a degree of variation in the oxygenation of the water versus surface and then the, the depths that we're finding? Because maybe that oxygen level is having a role in it. Um, just kind of throwing sticks out, but that would seem to be a reasonable option. I don't know in the literature of any correlation as such. We, it might be some factor of free radicals with oxygen atoms and stuff when they do get infected that it, why it speeds up the, the um, infection rate and the, uh, the uh, mortality rates and stuff. It, it, this is all ongoing research. The jury is still out and we all doing our best to wrap our heads around it that we can have um, some treatments that are very effective, efficient, and cheap. That's the bottom line. There has been uh, one study that came out of Florida that does show that it's not restricted by depth. And that they found it from 5 to uh, 100, not 100 meters, sorry. Sorry, I'm still getting used to feet. From about um, <laughs> like 20 to 100 feet. The, it's not restricted by depth and that study has actually said that it's more prominent on the deeper reefs as well which is very interesting because that's not what we're seeing um, in Grand Cayman so far. It has moved from the shallow reef to the deeper reefs so that is one part of the project that we haven't been able to expand on yet and um, all of the mitigation efforts that we are focusing on right now on the shallow reef and um, it's harder to work at depth. We don't have enough time when we're down at depth to remove coral, so it's a slower process. But we have done some surveys out from where the shallow infected area is going deep and to see that it is on the wall. So that's why we're closing the dive sites on the deep reefs on that area as well as the shallow reefs. But we haven't seen it inside Rum Point yet. But that's one of the main things we want to get from you guys today as well is um, if you can look out for this um, disease and now you're all very well trained in identification <laughs> from my one second slide. Um, if you have a camera and you guys are all divers and you're out there on the reefs all the time, you can take photos and you can send them to us. Uh, we have a new app called EpiCollect, which is um, here, kind of. Uh, this is some instructions for doing it. You just have to download it on your phone or download it on your computer and you just need a Gmail account and you can access this app um, and you and it just talks you through it. You say what dive site you were on or your rough location or your um, coordinates and then you can add pictures of your corals and things like that. So your our eyes on the reefs when we're always on the same area doing all of this um, mitigation uh, treatments and things. Uh, you guys are in East End and you guys are in the South Coast and on the West Coast so it can pop up on the reef at any time, anywhere. We don't know what, why it got to the North Coast where it did. Um, it could be because of the nutrients that are coming out of the North Sound and for whatever reason that area is different because of in comparison to the rest of the island, we don't know. So it's a factor and we're taking everything into consideration, whether it was brought by boat or by dive gear, or if it's some chemical that's coming out of the North Sound, it's 
unfortunately we don't have the answers to that and people have been working on it for the past six years to find those answers so hopefully any day now <laughs> we might get some answers um, but yeah if you guys can report your sightings that's one major part where you can help us try and find this disease and just adding to that one of the things we're trying to do with the her collaborators out of Florida uh, with providing some samples is to see exactly if it is what they have there so that we can parallel the disease in itself to confirm fully though everything points to the same disease that will give us the answer we want exactly in you know what we're dealing with here is what they're dealing with there completely As uh, dime operators that have boats with uh, rinse tanks on them and showers and dive operations with the uh, shore rinse tanks, how are you proposing that we get rid of the rinse water? Well, we're sort of coming to you all in a discussion for answers. As to, I mean, it's going to be some hard questions and hard decisions going to have to be made because, you know, we're not. We're in this for you all too. You know, it's your bread and butter, but it's, we also stand the responsibility of um, conservation and protection of our coral reefs. So we got to work together on this whole issue to have very sensible solutions to this problem. So any suggestion that you can, as uh, stakeholders in this whole thing, can give us that you know we can. Well, how how are you guys doing? As far as, as clean, uh, clean your gear. buckets after you clean your gear. Would uh, um, do you want to talk about this? Sure. Yeah. Um, so, our, like all operations within the dive community are different, and um, so I know that some people go back to marina and their their boats stay in the marina, and you wash your gear off just with a hose and things like that. When we go back to the Department of Environment, our boat comes out of the water and we come back to the Department of Environment facility and we dump our gear in an ammonium-based solution, which is in a, a big tank, um, <coughs> and then we leave it on the gear for approximately 10 to 15 minutes, and then we wash off that ammonia um, back at a facility so it's not going straight back into the to the marine environment. It goes however however our drain is connected, it doesn't go straight back into the ocean. Like it would be different if you were in a marina and you had tubs and you were using your tubs and washing your gear. You couldn't then just like hose off your gear into the water at the marina because then it could harm the mangroves or whatever areas around the marina. Um, so that's what we have to figure out is, do we use ammonia? Uh, do you guys use ammonia or do you just use bleach, which is a compound that we also don't want to just dump back into the environment, but going into drains and things, it, it breaks down a lot faster than ammonium compounds do. So these are all just best practices that we're going off from experts in Florida. But what we've printed off for you guys, the protocol that's been accepted internationally. Um, but yeah, I understand that it might be a little bit of a logistical nightmare, so if we can come up with a plan together on how to not spread this disease, it would be, that's what this meeting is predominantly for, that and the closure of the dive sites. I mean, the discharge that Tommy mentioned is filtered through sand, which is optimum for it, you know, the soil and away from any the, the marine environment. So you're saying that if, we, if you were to dump it in, say, a drain, that, would that be acceptable? Or no, that's... Kind of treatment what we're suggesting, and we're open to ways about this, is, you know, it has to be filtered in some way in the sense of like some the type of soil, but you know, as we know, sand is one of the best filters out there. So, you know, how we come to an agreement on how we dispose of the ammonia-based ones, that, you know, if that in itself creates a 
is not a doable scenario. As we mentioned, uh, or my director and Tammy mentioned, you know, bleach might be the, the safer alternative in the sense that you know, it breaks down quicker and it's not as, as lethal to the marine environment. I was just, I don't have a boat and I don't park my boat in the marina, but what do sailboats and boats do with emptying their toilet and things? Cool. Off the wall. Why do they get it off the wall? <laughs> 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 or it gets That's a very good suggestion. Yeah, West Bay Dock, Yacht Club, all the bottom. Almost all the boats are going back to the same places. You wouldn't have to get set down right there. That's a really good idea. And I believe that's something that we could put in place. Yeah. yeah. Even if it's just a big collection tank, and then you take it back to your facility to filter it. It does say on the, the decontamination protocol that it has to be changed every day, so it would just be a case that someone fills it up with the correct amount of ammonia versus water, and then, yeah, yeah. we can yes. definitely discuss that and see if we can put something in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have another question. So, I, there was a study a couple of years ago. Um, that showed that plastic could be an important vector for coral disease. And based on where this one seems to be hitting, that, that could certainly be one of the ways it came to the island because that coast, that, that section is you know, inundated with plastic coming from the eastern Caribbean. I wonder if that's been looked at. I mean, I, I've, yeah. I've looked a lot into the sustaining coral tissue loss, like papers on it. I haven't seen that anywhere no. in any of them. If it's been shown in Asia that it's a possible vector, uh, I would think that it's certainly could explain why it's you know, appearing in the, the area on Cayman that it's here. Just yeah, that would be a very yeah. interesting study. It could be a predicted you know, yeah. indicator of where it might show up. One of the issues with I mean, right. it's not something we can really stop. But yeah, and it's, it's hard for us to study it as well because we don't know what the pathogen is yeah. and because we, don't, we can't test it. Yeah. So that's why it's difficult even to decontaminate gear. It's just on best practice of what kills the majority of bacteria and viruses, right? It's, we can't take a swab and swab for the disease because we don't know exactly what it is yet. We have uh, right, rough ideas from certain studies that have been done in the States and that have found certain types of bacteria that could be possible, but it's nothing definitive. Um, so it could be a case as the research evolves that we do have, a, it's definitely this type of bacteria with, because bacteria are tiny, you know, like this, there's a whole completely different environment on that one polyp that's this size. So it's like, a needle in a haystack when you're trying to find out which one of those or whether it's a virus that's causing the disease. Um, but as we get more answers, it'll be it'll unleash a whole other area that we can study whether we can go straight away and look in the bilge and say, oh, the pathogen's in here and that's definitely something that we need to clean. But for now, we're just sort of saying that we should clean everything that could be possible in transferring the disease. And just, just adding a little bit to that, you know, one of the studies we're getting involved with is looking at the changes in a microbial community from as the disease moves through, because we know it changes. And, you know, having data 
what it was like, what happens in the middle part of it when it starts to get sick, and then subsequent changes after that. This is in an effort to try and isolate that pathogen that's, you know, cause and effect. So, so we're also aware that public health officials were speaking about the need to disinfect dive gear from a COVID-19 perspective. And, you know, one of the things that we, uh, is obvious to us is that if the same disinfection can apply for COVID-19 and stony coral tissue loss disease in terms of your dive gear, then that makes sense from the perspective of what we're having to do with COVID-19 because, you know, chlorine bleach, for example, is diluted to the proper uh, concentration, uh, can be effective for COVID-19 disinfections, and it can be effective for stony coral tissue loss disease as well. So that's also something to consider, think about from an <coughs> operational perspective, whether you guys can kill two birds with one stone, um, applying the same disinfection for both, both uh, diseases. Um, I let, uh, considering the proximity to the affected areas and their respective channels, do we consider the recreational activities at Stingray City Sandbar and at Run Point, which is significant boat traffic and person traffic, do we consider them the risk of contamination and spread? Um, at the moment, I mean, all they are risks, but it's minimal as compared to in water activity in the diseased area. At the moment, we see no, no evidence of the disease in behind the back reef environment or, or in the Stingray City area, just on the fore reef outside the shallow terrace and the deep terrace. So that said, um, that's why we're proposing even, you know, for when we say in water, in water activities, we don't want people anchoring because the possibility of contacting the <coughs> coral with the disease, pulling it up and swinging around or moving five miles up and then dropping the anchor and putting that on another coral. You know, we know it, it trans one of the modes of transmission is by direct contact. So that's why that area that we we're proposing that we don't no dive or no in water activities between Delilah Delight and Beer's paw. It's just the disease is concentrated there, but the prevalence is really high within that. So, did that answer your question, Ayo? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, you kind of mentioned you're concerned about it. Um, but, so, even somebody mentioned the showering. So, if these people get onto a boat, all your dive gear is just brushing with water coming off of it. Are you worried about all that water just sitting on the boat? like? So if that company drives all the way back to Easton from the North Wall and all that water on top is dripping off, would it be effective to like rinse your boat off like the deck before you even take off from that area? Or even like dive gear? Like when the people are getting out of the water, spraying them off or something just to get less? Yeah, I agree with your statement. Um, yeah, that is a, a, a risk of, of that. And the, the only alternative I see around that is exactly like you say, possibly with, you know, chlorine. Yeah. But in all honesty with the whole being with the dive community, I would suggest even trying to avoid as much as possible the north area till we get a handle on this, that we know what's going on, that we can apply measures that are effective and efficient and in combating this disease. But until then, you know, it's, it would be very wise, be a wise suggestion to totally try to stay out of that, the northern track of Grand Cayman. Is there a time frame for the disease to, for lack of a better term, burn itself out? Um, so the first right. site that we find the disease, it's still moving on that site. So in places in Florida, it's progressed and then it's left the resilient corals that haven't shown infection for whatever reason. You have different microbial communities or healthy bacteria that are fighting the disease. And 
but it's still progressing on that first reef that has been infected since June. So, and that could be because of the amount of corals that we have on our reef, and that is our, one of the main sites that we're monitoring and watching the progression of because we could then see how long it does spread on a reef, and we can see exactly what corals it infects and how quickly it passes on individuals as well as throughout that area of reef. Um, but in terms of lasting, like six years it's been in Florida and it's still moving in Florida. It's only recently got to the dry Tortugas, but it managed to get to Jamaica in 2017. It's like, it's, we don't know why, <laughs> we don't know how. Like, it seemed to appear in Jamaica before it appeared in the Bahamas or in um, Belize. So it managed to get past Cuba and against prevailing currents to some description. <laughs> if it went that way, it was against prevailing currents. I'm not sure about how it goes around Cuba, but um, so it could have been a, a boat, it could have been a ship and vessel or a, a cruise ship or dive gear, someone that dove in Florida and went on a disease site and then transferred the pathogen in their bladder of their BCD to Jamaica's reefs. Um, but now it's around the whole island in Jamaica. So it doesn't stop. Um, and in the beginning of this effort, uh, we always said it might not get here, or it might not get there. But the way that it's traveled in every other Caribbean region and in Florida is it doesn't really like leave any prisoners. It takes the whole areas, unfortunately. So we are expecting it to turn up in the sister islands, and we are expecting it to get to the east coast or in the west coast. But all these efforts that we're putting in place, a lot of it has not been done in other areas, so we're hoping it could possibly stop the disease or at least mitigate it and slow it down so that... Buy us some time. Buy us some time so that we can get a cure uh, that the scientists, and including us, are working hard to try and find. And so yeah, it's all about time, really. <laughs> What about the charter fishermen uh, going back and forth a lot to the coast fishing? So they go back and forth all the way along, trying to catch tuna or whatever, and off the wall. And they quickly come in pretty close to the dead side. So like you mentioned before about the uh, uh, cleaning of the villages, helping out with it to make sure it's in the case of that area. But then there hasn't been any major fishermen here that could represent them or anything. Um. Again, you know, they're, they're off the wall, for one, you know, into the abyssal depths, and it's a bit of a low risk, in, our, in my opinion, because they're, most of the times they fish at least a 600-foot contour, which puts them, at most places, like, you know, a quarter of a mile or an eighth of a mile off of the shelf in itself. What, what we don't want is the bottom fishing people, because the majority of them, as you know, fish with a you know, cement blocker, throw an anchor off and stuff, and the possibility of contacting the reef is what we don't want. Not that we think like a fishing line is going to, catching a fish going to in any way cause anything, but we just have to put measures in place that the chance of them throwing an anchor, touching a disease coral and transferring to somewhere else is minimized. Or mitigated against. Yeah, it's something we're, we're thinking a lot about that because we don't know how it's transferring. That is a major area. There's lots of boats that come in and out of those channels in that area is diseased and those boats go here, there and everywhere and we don't have too much control over it. So that is something that we'll be thinking a lot about in the future on, and seeing. We're going to find out um, with all of our research that's been put in place, how um, how our mitigation efforts are being successful or not. So we'll, this is a dynamic plan um, and it's constantly changing. So when the next time we meet, it will be, we might have the same protocols or they might be slightly different based on best practice from our results and from other um, re results around the Caribbean region and in Florida. So how long how long are you guys proposing that you close the north sites down for? 
At the moment, we are looking at quarter installments, say three months, and at the end of that, we will reassess where we're at and how things are going, you know, as we tackle this whole problem. And, you know, at the same time, you know, corresponding with the whole dive community and stuff as we move forward with it. I mean, th this has been around in Florida since 2014 and has been very persistent and steadfast. So unless we, as scientists and reef managers and policymakers and stakeholders in general, all work together to try and resolve this big problem because we have never seen nothing like this ever yet in the world, globally as to the mortality rates of it and all the species affected. And unless we all work together, we're not going to resolve this issue and we all have a stake into it. So it's in everybody's interest to all work together to try to get a very positive outcome. What, what we don't want to do is inaction that has happened regionally where they're in one sense, they don't have any healthy corals left to even understand what, what it's like to see and sample to see what the microbial, healthy microbial community looks like. So that's what we have at the moment that we are working with all these other institutions and collaborators to try and, and help not only ourselves but everybody else in the region. Uh, have there been any studies that um, show how long the, uh, the because you talked about it, possibly um, spreading from the parents, have there been studies where they have tanks with infected water and they can slowly test it uh, to see how long the disease can actually last in water? And I ask that question just because if you do dive at that site, having a little water in your DC or something like that, um, it might make sense just to, just like we do with COVID with any of our gear, we put a tag on it, we put a date, time, and everything, that you're supposed to leave it out for three days. If you could do that with, uh, with dive gear as well, just to make sure that, you know, if, if you're using gear at those sites, that you're consistently using the same gear so you're not going to take it off. Yeah, it's, it's similar um, to what I was saying earlier and just that we don't know what the pathogen or the bacterium is. So there's millions of bacteria on one tiny little area of this table, for example. So they have done studies to compare like disease sites and non-disease sites and sand on disease sites and non-disease sites and on the surface of the colony at a microbial level in comparison to healthy colonies and different aspects of the island that don't have the disease, not on our island specific, specifically, but in the Caribbean. Um, and they have found bacterial communities to be different, but there's it's like a needle in a haystack. They don't know specifically which one. So they can test like the water and see, oh, well, um, this doesn't have any of this group of bacteria now and it doesn't have any of these but we're talking about hundreds or more so it's like it's once we find out what that that like pathogen is it will make life a lot easier like it's just we're like a long time away from establishing why diseases are uh, the way they are in the marine environment it's like with covid we don't have a vaccine yet and it's been over a year now um, and the millions and millions and trillions of dollars probably is going into finding it so it's like you can imagine that there's not much money in the scientific <laughs> world at all so that's why we're so far behind on research with marine diseases and also because it's in water so the way that it transfers is completely different and it could be because of a million different reasons too um, in order to establish what a bacterium is that's causing an infection you have to isolate it in a lab and then reinfect healthy colonies and because it infects more than 20 species all of those colonies need to become infected before they say that it's 
yeah, it's just incredibly difficult. And I think there's only been maybe two diseases that they have a rough idea of what the um, the virus is or the bacterium is. And there's over 40 different Caribbean diseases. So, and they've been working on it for the past 50 to 40 years. So it's just like back in the Stone Age, unfortunately. <coughs> Um, so a lot of the discussion so far has been about the presumption that maybe we'll go to one of the dives <coughs> and then disinfect and then spread. Currently we're entering a period of the season where we're less likely to use the north due to the weather patterns and we're also in an uh, industry position where we're not as busy as we would be normally. Wouldn't it make more sense so everyone's picking, playing the same game that we just remove the moorings in this whole area, so no one goes there, including the weekend credit card captains who like to take their friends out and wouldn't be aware of this situation and could be vectors themselves. And we just focus on our operations on the west, the south, and the east ends where we're seeing no apparent infection rate. And that way, in a period where we're not able to actually make money of the north anyway, we're as an entire island community doing what we can to protect this entire region and ecosystem. Yeah, we have removed a few of them, and we're in the process of removing those moorings along that whole stretch there. Yeah, but good, good suggestion. Yeah, it's factors are on our side for now. It will be different when the tourist comes back and the seasons change and people want to go up north, but we will reassess um, the situation before then and have hopefully more answers and more known about the disease at that point too. Do we have any more questions? <laughs> Just real quick, is there a way to, to have any signage up there for people that aren't here in the room and that might not know if they should go out? So we are recording uh, the whole meeting. Um, I'm not sure how we're going to be making that available. Well, the idea is that once we have the recording, we can edit it, take bits of it, put it out to various different media. Mm -hmm. um, we're also going to be continuing to communicate the information not just to, to dive operators, but fishermen, the general community, weekend divers. We know we have a, a wider audience, but the important point was we wanted to get you guys in the room and give dive water sports operators three things so that you are fully aware. You now know everything that we know. <laughs> um, and we just wanted to, to just establish the communication with you so that we can continue to communicate about this disease as we find out more, um, as we can report how the disease is progressing, whether any of our interventions are successful, hopefully. Um, just let you know it's not going to be coming to you cold to talk to you about this. Um, but we do have to continue communicating um, with the wider community. We're aware of that. So, yeah. Can we add it to the weekly? Um COVID update briefing, you know, that the government does because a number of people watch that. That's a, that's a good idea. It's potentially yeah. something that we can try to do is get some airtime yeah. <laughs> on, yeah. um, on those on uh, those press briefings yeah. when we next have something to, to exactly. communicate. Yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah, that's a good idea. Because yeah. it involves like your point. It makes it more of a community effort, doesn't it? Absolutely. It involves everybody. If people aren't informed, how can they understand? Yeah. Because if they're told suddenly they can't, like, oh, we're not allowed to go to one exactly. point, and why can't we go to one point? It's all right. Yeah. kind of thing. This is what we yeah. want to do on the same day. Mm -hmm. If they're led to understand what is the real situation. Right. And that it, that it too could have a knock on effect on their income longer term. Yeah. So it might be like a short term thing, but for a longer term for the whole community. Mm -hmm. exactly. you know? yeah, the, the more involvement we get of all stakeholders in the community at large, the, the better chances, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to have been being successful in what we're trying to do. And it's in everybody's best interest to try and you know, do their best to make it all work. And I would also suggest to the whole you know, dive industry and anyone that you know, ideas that we did not think of today as we asked for input to 
please contact Tammy and the chief, the project manager and and let her know. Yeah. And if so. anyone wants to help, uh, yeah, that too. We'd like to know that too. Uh, we did bring a form that's there. It's just cute. Um, and for people to sign their lives away to us for the next three months, that would be great. <laughs> or any, if anyone has any time at all to donate and um, to the Department of Environment, um, it would be great to have, like to have you. And um, you all know the waters very well and are very aware of marine species. So it's, it would be good to have anyone that would like to help on board. We're expanding our volunteer group. And some of you have already been out with us more than once to help. Um, and we have more people signed up next week. So yeah, if you would like to donate your time, please write down your email and we'll send you out um, some information about our project more about our removal of strategies and things like that. It also gives you an opportunity to better understand what's really going on out there and what we're doing from that perspective. And you can so. see firsthand the devastation and what it looks like. It's always fun. <laughs> that is good for identification purposes. And um, you have the handout and you're welcome to take that out on your vessels and show people who are diving with you and things like that, like how to look out for it. But I understand that it's difficult to differentiate between bleaching and things. Um, so if you do come out with us, there's that opportunity to help as well as see for yourself what it looks like underwater and on the different species that it's infecting. I think we're going to have to wrap up now. Um, but just to say thank you all very, very much for your time. Um, we will continue to be in touch with you. Um, and if you have any input that you'd like to provide to us, please reach out to Tammy, Troy, and the team uh, and share your thoughts. And we'd be more than grateful to get any input that you have.